Bueno, pues uh, comenzamos esta, esta nueva sesión de, del Congreso. En este caso tenemos un debate de lujo, realmente algo que para nosotros es, es muy importante desde el proyecto MOVED porque eh, tendremos a, a dos de las figuras que nos han iluminado eh, en muchos sentidos, uh, Carlas en la cercanía ¿no? y, y Ariela Zulay a través de su obra en el, en el desarrollo de, de, del proyecto. Entonces, Uh, thank you very much, Ariela. Thank you, Carlos, for being here. Maybe I, I, I should introduce you first in Spanish, and then I will leave the, the floor to you. Uh, Ariela Zulay, no me voy a extender demasiado porque sé que todas las que estamos aquí conocemos muy bien el trabajo de Ariela Zulay. Entonces, es muy difícil presentar a Ariela Zulay porque uh, de algún modo es, es escritora, es comisaria, es cineasta, es investigadora en fotografía y artes visuales, fue Gladstein Visiting Professor en el Human Rights Center de, de la Universidad de Connecticut, eh, después actualmente eh, imparte clases en el Department of Comparative Literature en Brown University y eh, ha sido directora de diferentes grupos de investigación acerca de la fotografía, como cineasta tiene películas como A Nightfall y... Mmm, Casi comienzo desde, desde lo que para nosotros fue una auténtica revolución, que fue ese libro extraordinario que es The Civil Contract of Photography, publicado en el 2008, si mal no recuerdo, en el que bueno, aparece ya un compendio muy total de, de toda su trayectoria, lo que había hecho y lo que ha venido haciendo en los últimos años, porque verdaderamente me atrevería a decir que, que Ariela Zulay ha desplazado completamente el trabajo sobre el archivo eh, y el análisis de la fotografía hacia la filosofía política, ¿no? eh, el análisis del régimen imperial en particular en sus últimos libros y la deconstrucción de los relatos que se forjan en la, en la fotografía. Sugiero, si alguien lo, no lo conoce, visitar su página web Encargo Collective, que me parece que da una buena entrada a toda, a toda su obra. Y aparte de estos libros, obviamente, de este libro, eh, pues tiene otros que nos parecen absolutamente fundamentales en el pensamiento sobre la imagen contemporánea, y me atrevería a decir en el pensamiento contemporáneo, porque de algún modo no hay pensamiento contemporáneo si no es un pensamiento a través de las imágenes, ¿no? Como Civil Imagination, a Political Ontology of Photography, From Palestine to Israel, a Photographic Record of Destruction and State Formation, Con Adi Ophir, The One State Condition, Occupation and Democracy in Israel-Palestine, y Potential History, que prácticamente lo hemos elegido como título para, para esta sesión. Quisiera presentar también a Carlas Guerra, que es crítico de arte, docente, investigador, un perfil también como el de Ariel, a veces difícil de, de presentar por, por la, la, la cantidad de facetas ¿no? que, que tiene. Ha sido director de la Virreina, a Centra de la Imacha, el conservador jefe del Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Barcelona, del MACBA, y eh, seguidamente director de la Fundación Tapias y a lo largo de sus investigaciones, pues se ha ocupado sobre todo tipo de prácticas dialógicas entre arte, cultura visual, pedagogías críticas, prácticas documentales. Es profesor de la Universidad Pompeu Fabra, del eh, Center for Curatorial Studies del Bar College y ha comisariado una nómina de exposiciones que no, no reproduciré aquí para no alargarme, ¿no? Sobre Joaquim Jordá, Xavier Rivas, Aflam Shibli, Art and Language, que es una de sus especialidades, Alan Secula, una exposición que recuerdo con, con particular afecto por, por haber estado muy cercano a ella, como 79, un monumento a Instant Radicals, sobre Harun Faroqui, Susan Meiselas, y eh, sobre y con uh, Ariela Suray, ¿no? que ese es un espacio muy interesante porque eh, digamos, han colaborado, han trabajado juntos, mano a mano, en antifotoperiodismo, en su momento que creo que se sitúa en el centro de las cosas que nos preocupan y de las que hemos estado hablando aquí esta mañana, eh, sobre los motivos visuales, el trabajo concreto de las imágenes, ¿no? es algo sobre lo que creemos en el grupo a través de, de los production studies que es fundamental hablar, cómo se trabajan las imágenes. En Errata, que es en una exposición a mi entender monumental y, y modélica con ocho proyectos eh, paralelos ¿no? que, que, que la integraban sobre cuestiones, por ejemplo, eh, evidentemente sobre Israel, Palestina, pero también, por ejemplo, sobre la falta de documento y lo que podríamos llamar fotografía potencial de eh, todas las violaciones acaecidas de mujeres en, en, en Europa, en Alemania en particular después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial. La fotografía como un acto siempre presente en nuestras sociedades eh, eh, me parece que es absolutamente uno de los ejes de trabajo en los que converge eh, la labor tanto de Ariela Zulay como de Carlas Guerra. 
no me voy a extender más porque lo que queremos es escucharles uh, a ellas, a ellos. Uh, así que adelante, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Ariela and Carlos, for your time, for your generosity. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Iván. Eh, y gracias a todas las que estáis ahora también aquí conectadas y conectados. Y como no, gracias al grupo alrededor de Moveb con el que hemos tenido esas conversaciones tan productivas um, alrededor de una posible existencia del motivo visual, ¿no? Y ya van por lo menos dos libros. Um, so, I, I really want to thank you, um, Iván, because you did my job. I mean, you just presented Ariela in a way that I, I, I have almost nothing to, 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 to say. But, you know, I mean, if I can really add something, I must really confess that I, I feel like Ariela is not just, a, she's not just a colleague, but uh, a partner in crime, someone that uh, when I worked um, at institutions, uh, I mean, I always thought of her as a necessary contribution, as a clarifying uh, contribution. I remember when, um, you know, I was starting to prepare a project called Anti-Photojournalism, a critique of all the assumptions of photojournalism. She was absolutely fundamental with a book. She had just published uh, the civil contract of photography, transforming photography uh, into um, just a space, a fuel for a political philosophy practice, debate, and of course, I, I mean, like a, like a field in which you can really take action, not because you witness something, but because photography it is political by default. So I realize it's always been, uh, you know, I mean, in, in, in my practice as a curator, as a teacher, or as an educator, uh, I mean, someone I had to hold on to, I mean, her work. And of course, I mean, more recently, we, we collaborated in order to set up uh, a big project called Errata. And it happened to be the last project I took care of while working at the uh, Fundación Antoni Tapies. And it is one of the projects I must confess I feel most proud of, even though its materiality was one of the most precarious ones. And this is the, 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 the wonderful thing about Ariela. I mean, she doesn't need to deal with, uh, you know, erratic, um, uh, heavy, uh, charge or uh, important artifacts. She just works with uh, notions of archive that make everybody uh, sort of, uh, uh, that, that sort of empowers everybody to enter the archive, think about the conditions you enter this archive and how you can really use it if you want to use it in case you want to subscribe the logic of the archive, which as you know, I mean, she has recently been sort of uh, criticizing, deconstructing, and rebuilding the archive as a, one of a mystifying place in which the imperial grammar is inscribed, in which it seems that we get certain rights to access past events, whereas others do not really have those rights granted within the same archives. So um, that's where you know the work of Ariela merges uh, the photography studies with political philosophy. I must confess that she has left behind that moment when Roland Barthes was kind of a key, uh, kind of a basic uh, references. I mean, we, 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 we're somewhere else now. And uh, photography has really stretched out up to reach real actions, uh, real uh, sort of uh, possibilities for the future. So um, when we were thinking how to conduct this conversation with Ariel, I was proposing her to revisit some of the moments of her um, both academic activist and not, do not forget, I mean, she's also an artist and she claims herself as an artist, what makes me feel also even closer to her because, you know, when I've been uh, running an institution and I presented myself as an art critic, as a creator, and as an artist, everybody raised an eyebrow, you know, as if adding the, 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 the title of artist was something suspicious, something to be alert of. But, you know, I mean, I think that in both in her case and in my own personal case, I think that this title grants us a freedom that otherwise we would not 
you know how to define how to you know uh, comprehend so she's also an artist and yet she's a brilliant academic and she's a powerful activist and it, her most recent uh, preoccupation i would say and we were just talking about that um the minutes before uh, we started this um this uh, exchange or this uh, this conversation i mean uh, she's now really centered around the protocols about the way we will have to deal with a certain idea of restitution and uh, it is an urgent matter uh, because there have been state reports demands from grassroots communities and also because it is um, a practical thing we must do the minute we have the knowledge about the and balance representations that the colonial and, and imperial uh, regimes have implanted. And this, put, uh, th this will actually demand from us whether we are uh, academics, uh, students, um, you know, curators, critics, citizens to take action in this direction. So it's not just an, a speculative field, but it is something uh, that demands from us an urgent action to remedy some uh, particular situations. Um, in recent days, um, Ariel has been engaged in writing a report, an endorsement of a particular campaign in order to liberate a photograph of a former slave, um, Renty and former slaves, Renty and Delia, who were photographs and whose images were archived at Harvard University. This is, I think, a particular case that maybe we can jump directly into that uh, sort of, uh, you know, campaign, that sort of um, uh, action you have so prominently, um, you are so prominently leading uh, at this moment, Ariela, and this will give, um, those who are listening to us, an idea of uh, where you are. And if necessary, we will go back to your past books and trajectories. But I think, I mean, let's just start for what is really, a, you know, burning, a burning issue. So maybe yeah. you're going to introduce what this campaign is about. And this will also give us a, a different conception, a different understanding of what a visual motif is, or a very particular one, at least. Yeah, so uh, thank you, first of all, uh, Ivan, for, you know, uh, inviting us to have this conversation. And thank you, Carlos, for years of collaboration that we worked around different projects. It was always, you know, uh, fascinating and teaching to work with you. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be here together and to speak with you about these issues that, you know, you know so closely because of our, you know, long collaboration. Uh, including around this case where I was asked to write the amicus curia brief for this case, that th this brilliant uh, lawsuit by Tamara Lanier, and I asked some scholars and uh, uh, curators of photography to endorse uh, uh, the amicus brief and to endorse actually Lanier's uh, uh, lawsuit. So on this also we just recently collaborated. So I would like to share my screen if you don't mind, and I would like to talk about it through this uh, image. Um, yeah, I hope you all see it. Yep. Just a second, let me just up. I'm oh, sorry. Yep, now you see the image. So um, the image, you may recognize it. It's one of 15, you know, the daguerreotypes plates that were uh, commissioned by uh, a scientist. Uh, Louis Agassiz worked at the time at the 1850 uh, uh, at Harvard, and he has his, uh, you know, racist theory about polygenesis, about the fact that different races are, you know, that uh, uh, there are different races. And uh, he used photography at its very beginning, I would say, right? Photography, the device was invented somewhere at the end of the, at the uh, 40s of the 19th century. And in 1850, he already used photography in order to prove his racist theories. And in 2019, Tamara Lanier uh, uh, 
who did a research about her ancestors uh, under slavery, she recognized uh, she was able to track down uh, uh, that she's the descendant of Renty Taylor, whom you see in the picture. And I don't show you the daguerreotype as it is circulated by Harvard, but I show it in the way that Tamara Lanier, in collaboration with her daughter, you know, uh, gave this image a different, you know, uh, 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 display, which is under the campaign to free Renty. And the idea of the lawsuit is that uh, uh, Harvard possessed these objects only because Harvard was part of, you know, uh, enslavement of African Americans, and uh, they were part of understanding people as private property, as their pro property, as chattel property. And what she argues is that uh, 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 Renty, after the abolition, is still enslaved by Harvard. And how do I connect it to the notion of gift? Because, you know, we had some conversations about gift uh, 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 and about the, the way that you are working about iconography. And when Carlos spoke with me about iconography, the first thing that I told him I will be interested in presenting is the notion of the gift. So the notion of the gift is not an, uh, you know, an icon that you can recognize. It immediately takes us from the photograph into the event of photography. And the event of photography, not necessarily the way that it was produced through the camera, but the event of photography that is being provoked by the, our encounter with an image. So what I'm uh, trying to say in relation to Tamara Lanier is that, you know, former colonized, or uh, former enslaved or descendants or survivors of uh, regimes like slavery or like colonization, uh, when they are asking their rights, they are actually giving a gift to the colonizers. They are giving a gift to the perpetrators in order to free themselves from this position of perpetrators. Uh, and why is it necessary that the colonized will uh, offer a gift? because the colonized uh, uh, or the former enslaved or the survivor of or descendants of uh, enslaved people uh, should be gifted with something. But as we know, we are living uh, under the infrastructure of regimes of slavery and colonization. These regimes were not dismantled. And since they were not dismantled, we recognize them in the way that museums uh, 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 operate. We recognize them in the way that photography has been institutionalized. So rather than, you know, from the moment when uh, Tamara Lanier uh, tracked down that she's the descendant of Renty Taylor, rather than speaking with Tamara Lanier, opening the door, studying from her all the oral history that she inherited from her mother and from uh, uh, her other ancestors, Harvard locked the door and said no and published a volume with uh, uh, great scholars around these daguerreotypes without entering into conversation with Tamara Lanier. So what actually we see is that those infrastructures uh, in which you know, people like us are working, they can be curators, they can be directors of museums, they can be scholars, but they are inhabiting positions that refuses to repair the world under which these crimes like slavery uh, uh, happened, right? So what I would like to call your attention to is that when the colonized or former enslaves or their descendants are asking their rights, the, it includes also, it is entangled with a moment of uh, uh, offering a gift. Because otherwise, the perpetrators forever will uh, continue to operate those regimes. And those perpetrators are not necessarily the Arshi perpetrators who enslaved people, but these can be, you know, curators in museums that continue to take care of this image as an object, as the private property of Harvard, rather than as the ancestor of Tamara Lanier. And I would like just, you know, very briefly, if you don't mind, to show you two other incidents uh, from two different contexts around this notion of the gift. So this, you know, I will show you a few images from a film called A Black Girl by Osman Samben. Uh, and uh, in the, uh, I will not tell you, you know, the entire film, I will just dwell, you know, in one moment. Um, 
the film takes place in Senegal uh, in the car and uh, 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 this white couple, you see now only the women, you will see in a minute her partner, they are about to go back to uh, France and they are uh, hiring the services of uh, a black girl, uh, of these uh, women, uh, Diwana, and they want to take her with them to France. And uh, before they leave uh, uh, the car, she offers them a gift. She gives them this, you know, mask, and she gives them this mask because they have already several masks, you know, brilliant uh, uh, masks on their walls. And the uh, husband is coming, is appreciating the mask. He says, ah, yeah, this is really an authentic mask. And he put it on the wall. So what she's doing, she's offering them a gift as a beginning of a different, you know, uh, uh, a commitment between them. And uh, 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 the man is pulling this gift into the wall and take it out of circulation. And the relationship between her, who is supposed to be their, you know, helper in the house, uh, the relationship between her and these uh, uh, white patrons are deter deteriorating to a point where, you know, uh, 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 she takes back the gift, she takes back the mask, and the woman, the white woman is getting, you know, mad, and she's trying to pull it uh, away from her hands, and you see here in this scene, it's a very vertigo scene, I would say, in the film, when they are struggling over uh, the mask, and what I uh, invite you to see in it, I hope that you will watch the film. It's a very short film. You can find it on uh, YouTube. What I invite you to see in it is that the mask is not only a work of art. For them, they receive the mask, they put it on the wall like a work of art, and it's not part of the, uh, what uh, shaped their relationship. If you will watch the entire film, you will see how the mask plays different roles in the film. Um, and sh at the end of the uh, film, she commits suicide uh, uh, and uh, they are going to uh, restitute the mask, but they never received the gift that was offered them by the former colonized, which is to withdraw from their position where they have the power to oppress the others. And just very briefly from a different film, from Hidden by uh, uh, Michael uh, Hanke. I don't know if you uh, saw this film, but I'll show you very briefly and just, uh, it will echo. Uh, you know, this, uh, 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 this iconography that I invite you to recognize, which is not necessarily in the gesture, but it is in the encounter. And if you read my work from, you know, the civil contract, I am uh, not interested only in what we see in the photograph, only in what is recorded in it as an icon, but, understand, but I'm interested in the patterns that involved the, in the event of photography. And in these three cases that I've shown from Tamara Lanier, Black Girl by Osman Samben, and this one uh, uh, from Hidden, uh, uh, we see the repetition of the same pattern. We see that the former colonized or the for, uh, descendant of slavery uh, are often offering a gift and white people or white people who are working in white institutions, they have no idea what to do with it except to reject it, except to feel like if they will restitute the daguerreotype of Renty, they will be deprived of something. They consider that if a uh, court will decide, in the case of Tamawa Lanier Free Renty, if court will decide that the uh, daguerreotype should be restituted to Tamawa Lanier, they feel like something was taken from them rather than that they have received a gift. And for years, I'm struggling with how, you know, not to associate violence only with torn bodies, how to uh, look at violence as part of the apparatus in which we are implicated. So this is, you know, in continuity with this, how to recognize the gift when uh, uh, actually uh, 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 people who uh, uh, white people or people who inhabit white positions feel like something is being taken from them. And here we have, you know, in Hidden, I don't know if you uh, watch the film, so very briefly I will say, again, a white French couple is receiving, you know, a series of uh, videotapes and they are persuaded, he is persuaded, the men, that uh, these uh, uh, cassettes, these video cassettes come from uh, uh, a young boy that was uh, 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 raised by his uh, parents in their farm because his parents, uh, the parents of the uh, young uh, uh, Majid were uh, drawn by the French police in the scene uh, in their battle uh, struggle against Algerian. 
And uh, uh, this man, who is today, you know, uh, a presenter on the TV, he, when he was a child, he wanted this young Majid to be sent away from their home. And he's persuaded that this is the return of Majid, the violent return of Majid, who is actually sending him his disc cassette. And this is completely unfounded in the film. It cannot be proven. We have, you know, I have a different interpretation, but I will not dwell on it. I want to take it to the notion of the gift. So Majid at a certain point is being, you know, uh, 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 harassed actually by this white man and he commits uh, suicide and his son and, but before he commits suicide, this, you know, TV presenter is coming in and asking him, what do you actually want? Do you want money? Or what, what else? He's there in order to transform the notion of the gift that, you know, he was young at the age of 12. He did a mistake when he was 12, when he asked his parents to send away this guy. But the parents didn't act, you know, also properly and they didn't, you know, uh, 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 prevent their spoiled son from, you know, deciding what will take place at home. But now as an, old, as an older man, he has the opportunity to repair what he did to this, you know, young boy, young orphan when he was 12. But instead of repairing, he wants, you know, to remove this from his life and he offers, do you want money? What else? And then after this Majid commits suicide, he is telling to his son, uh, I am not to blame for this uh, suicide and uh, uh, I am sick of your crap, he tells him. And he asks him, so what do you want? And the son of Majid tells him actually nothing and he's going. So here we see for the third time in the three cases that I showed you, we see how a gift is being offered and uh, uh, the descendants of perpetrators or the perpetrators themselves, uh, uh, rather than you know, opening the door for repair, they are shutting the door and they are avoiding any communication, any conversation. So sorry that it was so long, I didn't plan it to be a long answer, but I think that, you know, these three cases together give us an idea how, you know, we have to look for iconography, not only in the gesture of offering, but in the encounter and the failed encounter, because, you know, uh, imperialism is embedded in the infrastructures of our different profession, uh, photography, museum, uh, curators, etc. Well, thank you, Ariella. On the contrary, I mean, this kind of uh, very condensed um, argument, uh, it really opens up the discussion to the possibility to reconsider the motif, not as a sort of an image that repeats itself in different situations, but as a sort of an arrangement or a particular kind of, uh, you know, distribution of roles and responsibilities around certain events, which is what you've been doing actually with the photography eh? and generating multiple events, not just the one recorded by the camera, but also those events that are kind of triggered by the encounter of people who come to look at photographs. So I think that th th there are several layers here and for the sake of clarity, we better sort of try to go one by one. I mean, I would propose to sort of go deeper into, uh, let's call it a methodological aspect, you know? I mean, how can we, after what you said, I mean, how can we rephrase the notion of the visual motif or this iconography? And I'm sorry, but I will always bring back, I mean, that particular example that somehow touched me or kind of for me it was kind of an, an epiphany of the way you work when standing in front of some images from um, Act of State, that wonderful project that you also presented at La Virreina uh, on within anti-photojournalism, a project in which you were gathering images from, uh, you know, Israelians and Palestinians <laughs> and trying to you know, identify what were the visual motifs of this occupation, visual motifs that were not obvious at first sight. And more concretely and specifically, I remember standing next to you in front of that one image of kids running on an unpaved road and an, an Israeli soldier standing by. And, and I asked you, you know, I mean, quite, uh, you know, um, uh, honestly, I mean, what, 
what's going on there? I mean, I, I, I don't see. And you just replied to me, you know, I mean, you, tell, you told me that you had these particular photographs for months in your desk until you realized what the issue was. And apparently what you said was that these kids were running out of a school, were leaving school, but contrary to what is not often the case, these kids were not running together uh, and, 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 and bonding and, and hugging each other, but they, they were running each other at a prudential distance because that was the public law implemented by Israeli uh, occupation on any sort of public meeting. So the, the fact that you even took some time, you know, to wait for the motif uh, to emerge, to for the, the, the subject of these photographs, I think that it, it makes us rethink what a, a visual motif is. Mm -hmm. So maybe it, it would be clarifying or it would help if you speak now, if you comment on the way you work for this massive project, which was an uh, act of a state. And if you describe it, I mean, the way you collected those images, the way you compile, the, the way you put them together in clusters of two, three, under particular dates and the particular gestures. Yeah, so thank you for bringing this, Carlos. Um, so, you know, I finished to write the civil contract of photography, which is a kind of fiction, right? It's, uh, it's not that there was any, you know, civil contract somewhere in the archive. It's a kind of fiction in the sense that I tried, you know, to read different, you know, people who wrote about photography, uh, uh, not from, um, not following their argument, but actually adding myself to the situation when they encounter a photograph and to see what's going on there to account for their encounter with photographs. So this was one way. Another way was to look at some photographs and to look at it not from the perspective or not only from the perspective of the photographer, but from the perspective of the photograph person or the spectator. So I wrote this fiction and I, you know, I uh, uh, studied some examples, but then uh, I wanted to experiment with uh, the civil uh, contract of photography. I wanted to see it on a, a larger scale. And I started to work on an exhibition called Act of State that you showed at La Virena uh, many years ago. And, uh, you know, I uh, started to collect photographs, many, many photographs from uh, uh, the Israeli uh, uh, occupation regime in uh, West Bank and Gaza. And immediately, you know, it raised questions about space, time, etc. I will not dwell on them. I will dwell more on the methodology that you asked me in relation to photography. And I realized that actually uh, 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 I need to develop a certain you know, approach to the images that I am looking at in order not to say, I will not show another image of you know, house demolition because I have already shown many of them, right? We have this kind you know, of uh, a mantra in the world of photography or in you know, the world of art and in other sphere that you know you have to single out something that is exceptional or something that tells you something else. But there were so many images of house demolition. Why should I discard them? Just because you know I will assume falsely that someone will be too tired to look at them. Each house is, you know, a demolition of, you know, life, world life. So I looked for something else. I looked for a different approach, how to work with these, you know, photographs. So I started to annotate them. I started to look at what I'm looking at, actually. Uh, I started to uh, uh, undo this category of house demolition because other house demolition, you have many tokens. Mm -hmm. But if you start to look at it, you see, so many things. So I started to annotate them. And once I started to annotate them, I started to see that uh, across time, over time, there is nothing like, you know, uh, uh, progress or development. We see the repetition of the same pattern. So the idea was to start to identify patterns, but they are, that they are irreducible only to motifs, visual motifs or gestures, but they have different aspects. And hence, what I started to do uh, is to, you know, I wanted to uh, engage with 40 years. It was in 2007. So it was 40 years of the Israeli occupation of West Bank and Gaza. Uh, um, 
so I started, you know, to organize the images uh, uh, in a way that I will have something, an overview over time, but without saying that there is something that changes over time. Uh, uh, so I, what I did is creating two uh, axes, and if you don't mind, I will share my screen uh, uh, and I will uh, show you what I mean by that. So first of all, uh, uh, I'll show this image uh, that you mentioned, uh, Carlos, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is an image from 69. So 69, we're speaking about, you know, two years after the uh, occupation of uh, the West Bank and Gaza. And we have to recall that this is also uh, uh, 21 years after the destruction of Palestine and the creation of the state of Israel uh, on its ruins. So this is the image that Carlos spoke about. And, you know, you see here children, you know, really all around this, you know, uh, uh, large road walking and, now, after Carlos uh, told you, so it's easy to see it, but you know, it's something that takes time sometimes to realize what, what is it exactly. So it's, you know, this separation uh, uh, between them that they are not allowed actually to go in uh, small groups. Uh, they are not allowed by the army. So not only the presence of the uh, soldier here, but the interiorization of what is allowed and what is not allowed in the public uh, sphere. Uh, uh, so the question is, what do you do with such a photograph when I wanted to show, you know, uh, approximately 700 photographs? So I wanted to show the repetition of this pattern where the soldiers are actually there in order to prevent people from getting together. And why do they prevent people from getting together? Because when we get together, we have power. Right, power is not only the institutions. We have power together, so they are uh, preventing this. So I wanted to look for, you know, other moments when you see it. So I didn't want necessarily to show that in each and every school the same uh, uh, pattern repeated, but I wanted to identify, uh, let's say, the uh, um, the inner logic of how it operates. So here, for example, you see a scene of arrest, right? You see this guy is being arrested. He's held by uh, uh, by the hand of one soldier who has a club in his right uh, hand. And you see here another soldier, right, with a club. But why do I connect this image to the previous image? Because if you will see behind him here, there is a third soldier with a club, right? So you could say that the motive is club, but no, the motive is not club. The motive is something else. He is chasing away with his club all these people who were around. He is isolating this person who was arrested, right? So what we see is how the uh, regime of occupation or any other colonizing regime, they are working on the fragmentation of the population. They are working on uh, uh, an attempt to prevent a counter power from uh, 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 emerging. Uh, <clears throat> So I was interested in uh, uh, the way that they are creating this isolation that was not there. So rather than, you know, uh, uh, like in this image that you encounter already the situation as the army would like it to be, as the, this regime aim it to be, they are already separated. Here you see it in the making. You see how the separation between people is being produced. So uh, the motif cannot be the club, the motif cannot be uh, 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 already the separated, you know, the fragmented society, the motif should be how this is being produced. So just, you know, in analogy, when I wrote uh, uh, the second book after the civil contract of photography, when I wrote the political ontology of photography, the idea was that rather than speaking, you know, in this tradition of different scholars who spoke about the ontology of the photograph, we must account for the ontology of the event of photography, the ontology of photography, and this ontology is political. What does it mean that it is political? That uh, we are getting together when we are engaged in the event of photography. I am speaking about political in the very, you know, basic Arendtian meaning of people getting together. And when we get together, 
surprise can happen. Gift can be offered in different directions. So just, you know, uh, uh, Carlos asked me to speak about the methodology. So here you see the space of the exhibition, the first one when I showed it in Tel Aviv, and you could see this is the timeline, the, you know, the lower line, and above the timeline you have, you know, the recurrence of those uh, 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 different uh, motive. This is the book in Hebrew. You could see it in the book. This is the year. And above the year, you have two other images. Or oh, this is the Italian book. This is 67. So the first image is from 67, but these are from later years. So uh, let me move from this, uh, uh, these two images that I show to this image, because uh, uh, here lies, you know, the uh, kernel, I would say, of the civil contract of photography. These three images, again, from three different moments. Uh, uh, they, you know, one of them was in the timeline, in the, uh, uh, you know, 67, 68, 69, etc. cetera. Uh, this was the first one, and above them, there were others. So in this image of Aisha el Kord, uh, 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 you could, uh, you know, analyze it as the motif of the Pietà, right? You could speak about, you know, Christianity, you can interpret it in this way, but actually, uh, as I read it in connection to other frames in the contact sheet of the photographer, uh, the late Micha Kirchner, uh, uh, she went to dress up, right, for this image. So there was a moment of collaboration between her and the photographer, how to produce an image, how she wanted to be taken in an image, understanding at this time at 88, which is the very beginning of the second, the first Intifada, sorry, understanding that she would like to convey a certain message. So uh, uh, rather than, you know, speaking about the photographer and speaking about this photograph in connection to his other photographs, what I wanted to emphasize in this, you know, uh, 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 cluster or in this, you know, sequence is when the photographed person either actively or proactively participate in the event of photography or even provoke it. So here, moving to a different image by uh, uh, Miss Abu Zuhir that was taken in 88 by uh, uh, Mickey Kratzman, he actually didn't take the photograph, right? He, uh, uh, she told him, you will take a photograph of my uh, uh, legs that were hit by a rubber bullets, but she told him, you go outside of the room. The woman who came with you to translate, she will take my photograph. So she completely, you know, uh, 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 articulated or she uh, uh, guided the event of photography mediated by the camera and proactively decided how she will be taken in a photograph. So not only she's showing to the camera the wounds that she got from rubber bullet while the photographer told her, but you know, my editor will not show another, you know, rubber bullet uh, hit. Uh, and she also invited someone from the family to look at her leg, which means she already, you know, uh, 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 inserted an internal spectator to the photograph that tells us external spectators how to look at her, to look at the leg, to look at what was done to her. And in the third photograph, what we have is, a, uh, uh, this one is already from 2002 by Eldad Raffaele. What we have is uh, six uh, boys who actually told the photographer, uh, uh, you will take us in a photograph outside. Uh, their city uh, uh, was under curfew and they disobeyed the curfew. They, uh, uh, they refused to recognize the legitimacy of the regime of occupation, and they wanted their photograph to be taken uh, uh, outside, which means take me in a photograph, meaning I am uh, refusing to recognize the legitimacy of the regime of care of you. So this is how I tried to uh, uh, somehow, you know, work with these images in order to account for all the participants the photograph persons, the photographers, uh, the internal spectators, us belated spectators, and in a way that we have to decide where do we position ourselves? Do we position ourselves in uh, uh, the position of, uh, you know, the regime of occupation, or do we uh, uh, recognize uh, uh, the claims of Palestinians to return and to dismantle the regime of occupation? Terrific argument, um, uh, Ariel, as usual, and I think quite illustrative of your what French they call your 
Dimash, uh, your kind of uh, the way you have evolved in, in dealing with photography and political philosophy. But uh, I must confess that among all those participants, we must find ourselves as researchers, as observers, and not just as kind of innocent participants. Um, I would say even we probably are the less innocent of all that sequence of participants. And on the contrary, as researchers, we often have been complicit or we have um, sort of been um, equally responsible for distributing roles among those participants, you know, the subject to be photographed, the photographer, the observer, et cetera, the interpreter, whatsoever. But um, let's just speak about the, these, actually this necessity to come to terms with our status as privileged participants in not only among these debates, but within this culture of archive uh, image analysis. And I would like to recall, uh, I mean, um, how you dealt with, uh, with, with one of the films that was included at the Tapis Foundation exhibition, Rata, which is uh, undocumented, in which you really attack, you, you, you launch a fierce attack on the um, kind of um, unequal um, relationship between a series of objects which have been plundered, which have been kind of pillaged or maybe given, uh, which we find very well documented in ethnographic museums, Musée de l'Homme, British Museum, whatever. And then on the other hand, the, 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 the recognition that the people that were the communities, the users of those objects, the minute they come to meet those objects, they arrive to us and they are labeled as undocumented. So again, um, you know, I mean, I, I would like you to clarify these power relationships uh, between, in this case, objects, you know, uh, the so-called migrants, undocumented people, and ourselves as observers, interpreters, researchers, who are somehow, um, you know, approving of this academic logic in which the, the, the documented uh, objects, the papers, the academic knowledge is actually uh, contributing to a division of responsibilities, a division of, uh, you know, of possibilities, of future possibilities of action. So I think you have something to say about this, and it would be also important to just interpolate ourselves as researchers. Yeah, so thank you, Carlos, uh, for this question. Uh, so yes, I completely agree. It's the division of responsibilities, and it's also the division of what is being, uh, the division between the different uh, 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 type of things that were plundered, that we are also being invited to relate to them as different types. And uh, here I would like to dwell in connection to your question, in connection to the film Undocumented, to the uh, 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 way that museums were built in order to uh, host, to preserve as they pretend they are doing objects and archives were uh, generated in order to preserve documents. And we as scholars or we as photographer, we as curator, we are being interpolated to relate to them as two different things. So the category of the undocumented uh, that I'm, I used as a uh, uh, title for the film emblematizes this because you know we are speaking about people who are migrating or trying to migrate to Europe or to the US, uh, to the US mainly you know from South America or uh, Central America, but to Europe from its pro, uh, uh, former colonies, right? Who are the people who are migrating to Europe? People whose countries were destroyed by different colonial European powers, be it Portuguese, Spanish, French, British, uh, German, etc. So uh, um, they are trying to migrate to Europe and they are being led to die in the sea or they are being led to slow uh, death in uh, camps. And anyhow, uh, nobody is interested in uh, uh, their demand to reach out to the places who for centuries or for decades uh, 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 invaded their countries, plundered their objects, ruined uh, their different political formations or social formations and left 
uh, sometimes, you know, uh, as part of the process of decolonization. So uh, these people, when they are trying to enter Europe, they are being uh, 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 defined as undocumented. They don't have the right documents to enter, hence they can be treated in the way that they are being treated. But what I'm trying to do in undocumented is to say that they have all the documents in the form of objects. All the objects that were looted from their countries that are being preserved, carefully preserved in museums, these are their documents that justify their request to enter. So what I'm trying to do is to undo this division between document and object and try to uh, 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 say, uh, to respond to the, uh, uh, their claim to enter. And if I was, you know, to write this uh, text about the motif of the gift, I would end it with uh, uh, the undocumented, uh, undocumented with quotation mark, who are knocking on the door of Europe, offering Europe a gift, a gift to uh, repair past crimes, a gift to welcome these people and to try to transform the history of relationship that Europe had with these mm. people coming from their former colonies. But Europe rejects uh, you know, uh, uh, the gift and fortify itself and uh, uh, outsource you know, the job of uh, letting them die to other uh, countries like Turkey and uh, others. So here we are again with the colonized offering a gift and Europe is uh, shutting its eyes, its heart and everything. And I think that, you know, when we see, you know, individuals or small groups in Europe trying, you know, to attend to these, you know, uh, 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 people who are being called undocumented by their governments, they are actually doing the right thing. They are actually recognizing them as their co-citizens, mm -hmm. as the people uh, 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 with whom they have a shared past and a past that should be repaired. But there are tiny, tiny minorities, as we know. Great. Hopefully we can read that text soon. And it, I think it, it will make a great contribution to all the debates on the Bible motif to signal the, 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 that it's not just an iconographic uh, sort of um, dilettantism, but really a, a, a way also to conceive new political forms of political action, as, as we often say here. Okay, I think, I mean, you've given enough, you've been generous enough, and it would be time and moment to, the moment to open the floor for questions from our colleagues who are on the other side of the screen. So uh, you're welcome to, to raise issues, questions. Maybe, hi, Carlos. Hi, Manuel. Hi. <laughs> Maybe I can start uh, unless unless Ivan was, wants to ask first or, or somebody else. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Thank you both, Carlos and, and Ariela, for what you were doing. And I especially like the way in which Ariela pointed out the relation between the US and South and Central America. And immediately after that, she pointed out the relation between Europe and their our former colonies. Because sometimes I get the feeling that the Condor operation that the CIA developed during the 70s, the 80s, you not know, subcontract, subcontracting uh, the, the death of the undocumented, the death of the enslaved, which is you no know, a northern, southern dynamic there. It's, 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 it's exactly what is happening here. You know? mm -hmm. But somebody in Europe doesn't acknowledge that, that our governments are making or we are making our own sort of Condor operation, paying people in Morocco, paying people in the other side of the sea to do this job, no? So I, I thought you put it, but my question is, is it's not exactly that. Uh, during the conference, uh, there was a table about the iconographies of COVID-19. And immediately when you showed the photograph that impressed Carles some years ago of the distance, no? Mm -hmm. And the social distancing, no, of the military, uh, executed or, or preserved towards the children, you made me think, and you talked about fragmentation, you made me think of how the digital or, or this thing that is happening now, we are fragmented bodies, no, talking in an alleged conference, but we are not together. How do you see the, the, the social distancing measures and other measures related to COVID-19 in relation to uh, 
these contracts or these situations or your concept of, of photography as, as a political decent counter or however we want to call it. And thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you for this question. Um, I think that, you know, we see it with imperial technologies and I consider, you know, photography to be one of the imperial technologies, even though, you know, it can be used for other purposes. But, you know, with any imperial technology, once it is implemented, it can be used for different, uh, you know, contexts. And I think that what we saw, I don't know, you know, exactly how it happened in Europe, but I can say about where I am living in the last 10 years in the US, at uh, the moment the COVID, uh, you know, first of all, nobody believed here that, uh, you know, what is going on in China will happen here. But once, you know, the facts were there and uh, uh, COVID started to uh, spread all over, what they decided in uh, all the universities is to dismantle, to disband the university. This was the first intuition. And, you know, in, uh, uh, in the US, I think that this doesn't uh, work the same way in Europe. Universities are kind of, you know, uh, petty sovereign. Each university is about, you know, 30 to 2000 uh, students. There are town, university town where, you know, the entire town is built on these students. So while uh, uh, the presidents of this university decided to spread, you know, to send uh, the students away to their parents, uh, they actually dismantle, you know, cities, cities that are built on the presence of these students. So rather than thinking, how will we generate, you know, mutual aid, how we will help each other while, you know, respecting certain, you know, measures of social distancing, of masking, of quarantining, etc. Rather than implementing it as part of the social fabric, they are instinct and they you know, imitated one after the other, all the university, their instinct was to send the students away, nationally and internationally. So I didn't, didn't read, you know, a uh, 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 research about how did the university spread actually the virus across the globe when sending students to their homes. But what I can tell without reading your research is that they disrupted the little infrastructure of mutual aid that we still have in our societies. So people found themselves, you know, alone mourning, alone taking care of their needs if they were, you know, elderly, if they were sick, rather than, you know, uh, being there to put food behind their door, rather than being there for different services, people were just not here any longer. So uh, yeah, the uh, technology of uh, uh, destroying other, you know, social formations, other social fabrics, the technologies of fragmenting the society for people not to not be able to take care of themselves uh, based on their, you know, ancestral knowledge or their cosmologies. All these, you know, technologies were there and we saw how quickly they were, uh, have been used uh, with the beginning of COVID. So I don't know if it replies to your question, but this is my first, you know, response to it. I wonder if there are any more questions or issues. Yeah, I'm sorry that I spoke about, you know, the three films at the beginning, the two films at the beginning, films that maybe you didn't see. And I know it's always difficult you know, to hear. These guys are film. film so they saw uh, all films. I don't have yeah. to worry. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure they, they, they know each of those films by heart. Okay. okay. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I just after what Manuel uh, was saying, I, I was thinking that, you know, I mean, we tend to think colonialism as a sort of um, regime that was deployed somewhere else in, in whether in Africa and South America and Asia, whatever. But I mean, considering uh, Achille and Mendes' uh, latest contributions, I mean, we can easily say that Africa is also, that Europe is part of Africa now and not the other way around. And so all these kind of former analysis, all these analysis of former forms of colonialism now are come, come across as true rehearsals for what we are to leave tomorrow. I mean, in, in the next uh, in the next weeks or in the next uh, in the next years, so that uh, I mean, this colonial regime is not something happening 
at, in a different time in a different Spain, but it is in a different sort, uh, in a different space. But in it is actually starting to happen among us, you know. And yeah. So maybe if there are no other questions, I yeah, I mean, maybe yeah. run to the university <laughs> because I still have, you know, a heavy, uh, heavy duty day. Right. No, I mean, we were here for almost one hour now, an hour a little bit more. So um, if you feel um, that this is uh, good enough, we can stop here, not without saying thank you very much, uh, Ariella, because I mean, those kind of uh, three arguments you first presented by yourself were really powerful to understand what you are doing, what you're dealing with. And I mean, even to, to open up like uh, what will be future projects for sure. And I want to thank you, Ivan and, and the whole team behind also for making possible this, um, this session, this presentation. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, thank Carlos. You thank you, Ivan and everybody, everyone. Thank you very much, both. Thank you, Ariela, and thank you, Carlos. Uh, I think that, that now everybody of, of us, we are all thinking about which is our position in front of images and which is our position in front of research, because you, you have put in front of us the, the most important question, what, 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 who we are when we are in front of the images. Right. So uh, thank you for, for doing that. That uh, I think that for us is a very, important thing uh, particularly now that we are uh, trying to 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 do this this research so thank you very much for your your time and generosity and thank you thank you very much carlos you are welcome <laughs> thank you okay okay bye you. bye 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 have a good day Ariela. bye thanks bye